Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking the movie Guardians of the Galaxy. This is one that I've been looking forward to for quite a long time. I had really high expectations of this movie, and I was not disappointed. It is a really great, really fun movie. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, from what I've been hearing online, it's apparently well on its way to breaking records for um, movie openings in August. And it basically, it's already considered quite quite a big hit. And uh, even before the movie hit theaters, Marvel had announced that they were going to be doing Guardians of the Galaxy 2. So Marvel obviously had a lot of faith in this movie, and that move faith was certainly well-placed. So what I'm going to do now is um, just kind of start talking about the characters, and then we'll kind of talk about some details of the plot. <clears throat> so let's just kind of get into things. Uh, let's start with the smaller characters first and kind of work our way up. And, um, uh, well, actually, yeah, let's kind of start off with uh, the Nova Corps. Uh, now, I know some people were really disappointed that uh, basically these guys weren't, you know, flying around and uh, didn't have the classic Nova Corps helmets. And, um, and if you're not familiar with uh, the Nova Corps in the comics, basically they're kind of like the Marvel Universe's version of the Green Lanterns is a really simplistic way to put it, but more or less accurate. They're the big space cops of the Marvel Universe, and they tend to wear uh, really funky helmets with a uh, big red Nova Corps star on them. And uh, we don't really see any of that. We do sort of get to see the, the Nova chest insignia, and we do get to see the star symbol on, on the, the, their headquarters and kind of in the shape of their ships. But again, really not classic Nova Corps stuff. And from what I've heard, apparently James Gunn, the director of uh, the movie, was not a fan of those elements, so they were just kind of ditched, which is disappointing, but that doesn't mean that we might, we'll might never get to see them. It's something that they might do in a future movie. Maybe Marvel will put a little bit of pressure on the guy to uh, put that in there, or we might never get to see it, and horror of horrors, we might have to sort of deal with a change. I, I know there are some people out there who are very, very big Nova fanatics, but at the end of the day, Nova is not really, the Nova and the Nova Corps are not huge players in the Marvel Universe, so I, I think Marvel is going to be okay with uh, maybe toning them down somewhat, so if, if that's what it takes to keep James Gunn happy, because, well, he's directed a big hit movie for them, so obviously they're going to want to keep working with him. Uh, now, the three folks that we get with uh, in the Nova Corps, we have a Nova Prime, whose um, actual name is never mentioned in the movie, and I, I don't remember what it is. But anyway, she's played by Glenn Close, which is um, an impressive casting uh, there. You know, Glenn Close has a laundry list of really, really great acting credits. But you sort of wonder why um, they went to somebody you know of her caliber for what's really a fairly minor role. But I guess at the end of the day, they wanted us to take the Nova Corps seriously, and they wanted somebody at the center of it all who had the gravitas to show that the Nova Corps were people who needed to be taken seriously. And Glenn Close is certainly somebody who can bring that. Uh, now, the other one of the other folks that we have in the Nova Corps, uh, and again, one thing I need to make clear if you're running me for the first time is that I'm terrible at remembering actors' names. And uh, I don't think, I just do not remember the name of this guy's character either. But uh, basically the curly-haired dude who looks a lot like Norm from Cheers. Um, he was also incidentally the voice of Wreck-It Ralph from what I've heard. Now, I, I did like this guy's character. You know, he, he got to have a lot of moments where being funny, he's ultimately the one that the Guardians turn to when they need to kind of enlist the Nova Corps' aid in saving Xandar. And... You know, he's somebody who basically, he's basically kind of the good cop. He's there, and he even flat out says, like, look, uh, you know, I've kind of arrested Star-Lord. He wouldn't be coming to me with this if he wasn't serious. So here we kind of get to see with him and with Glenn Close's character, you know, the positive side of the Nova Corps. And uh, this, this is contrasted by um, the Nova Corps guy with the British accent who was actually, interestingly, uh, the voice of Darth Maul in the uh, Star Wars prequels. Not the physical guy, of course, that was Ray Park, but the few times Darth Maul did speak, they dubbed in this guy's voice. And uh, 
he does have a very nice uh, British accent, so not kind of a good choice there. Anyway, <clears throat> now he's somewhat of the more negative side of things, and they even say that uh, the kiln, the prison where the guardians are locked up, is where they kind of dump the crooked and bad Nova Corps officers. So I like that this movie does present the Nova Corps as an, a generally good organization, but like any organization, one with bad apples. But even so, even though this guy is the one who's very skeptical of our um, protagonists, at the end of the day, he's also someone who sacrifices his life in order to save innocent people, to save his home. So he's shown that, yeah, he might not be the Guardian's biggest fan, but at the end of the day, he was also someone who was brave and willingly sacrificed himself for the greater good. So again, even though he's a side character, he is presented as somewhat multifaceted, which is really cool. Um, so that wraps that up. Let's kind of, again, continue talking about, let's go over and talk about the, the villains of this movie. Uh, not a huge amount to say about Benicio Del Toro as the Collector. We, of course, get to see a little bit more of him than that little cameo he did at the end of Thor The Dark World. And it's made quite clear, by the way, he's um likes to enslave those pink-skinned ladies, that he, the Collector is not a good guy. And, and I really do love the um, the look that they've come up with him. Uh, I think Benicio Del Toro uh, described it as sort of space Liberace. And, and if you don't know who Liberace is, he's basically the even more flamboyant version of Elton John, who was a, a performer who was basically an institution in Las Vegas for many, many years. And uh, he, he has his own museum there. I've been to it, and wow, this guy was amazingly over the top. But anyway, getting back to the movie. Um, yeah, basically the Collector is, is he is a villain in the comics, and here we do get to see that uh, side to him. But he also is there to deliver some very important exposition as to what exactly the Infinity Stones are. You know, I'm a reader of the comics, so it's very hard for me not to call them the Infinity Gems. And, you know, that, that provides us with what's obviously some very important information for when they do Avengers 3, which is, of course, obviously going to be the, inf the Infinity Gauntlet story. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, yeah, one thing that I finally realized with this movie that's kind of been throwing me off is apparently the power that is associated with the gems is different. Like each color has a power that's associated with. Like for example, the blue gem is is for like involves minds. Well, they've switched it around between the comics and the and the movie universe. I'm not really sure why. And that that's kind of been confused. It only dawned on me now as to why that, that this was happening. So it's it's a little confusing in my mind. But you know, okay, well, whatever. Uh, this time around, even though it's purple, they are going with, I believe it is, the Destruction Gem. Yeah, in, in the comics, if I remember right, purple is the Space Gem. It allows you to teleport all over the place. And, you know, I don't really understand why they made this change, but I'm not really going to get upset about it. Uh, let's see, but yeah, I think that's kind of all we have. To, I have to say about the Collector. He's just sort of there to mostly deliver exposition and then of course we get that funny scene with at him at the end which I'll talk about later. Uh, moving on to our our villains in general, uh, we have Karen Gillian of Doctor Who fame as Nebula and she does this really really well. I really did like her take on Nebula. I really was thinking that Nebula would come across as kind of a thin character and she's obviously not the most well fleshed out character but they did more with her than I was expecting. And Gillian really does do a great job of portraying that Nebula is a very, very messed up person. Now, I suppose my view of all this whole thing, especially the relationship between her and Gamora, might be a little bit colored by the fact that I read the official Guardians of the Galaxy prequel comic, which actually did go into her and Gamora's backstory a lot more than is uh, presented in the film. Actually, I think it's more fun to put flaws, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know more about the character than was presented on screen. That might be coloring things a shade for me. 
but still, um, you definitely do get to are those reminders that uh, she was like surgically enhanced, like you know, after she's hurt, her body jerks back into position in some really creepy and abnormal ways. And I really do wish they'd kind of done that with Gamora too, to sort of remind us a little bit more clearly that uh, they are, you know, two people who kind of in some ways come from the same mold, but have taken very different paths. But again, the whole point there is make Nebula seem creepy and make Gamora seem heroic. So I... Now, I was honestly surprised that Nebula did survive the um, this because, you know, it's a Marvel movie. You sort of tend to expect the bad guys are probably going to die. But uh, they've already, as I said, they've already announced Guardians 2, so they're probably going to bring her back. And again, Karen Gillian... Uh, after all of her time as Amy Pond on Doctor Two has very serious fan credibility, and well, hopefully they're going to get more into her relationship with Gamora in the sequel. So I can't really blame them for wanting to keep someone like Karen Gillian around for another movie. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, now, um, oh yeah, can't forget to talk about uh, Korath the Pursuer. Uh, who's the you know the guy that busts Star Lord um, uh, at the very beginning of the movie? Now here he's presented being fairly different than he is in the comics, at least visually. In the comics, he's just sort of basically a blue skin guy in what looks like um, a cheap juggernaut costume. Here he's obviously played by a black dude, and um, the thing with the Kree, the member, of the, the alien race he's a member of, is they have two different types. They have the blue skinned Kree, like Ronan. And then they have another group of Scree who, Kree who are called the pink-skinned, and in the comics, these are the ones that basically look like exactly like Caucasians. Now, here it looks like in the Marvel Universe, Cinematic Universe, they sort of revised it to the um, quote-unquote pink-skinned Kree having the various hues of Earth humans. You know what? Oh, okay, I, I, I'm okay with that. You know, one of the um, problems with sort of classic science fiction is you'd kind of have people go off to alien planets and they'd find not only aliens that look just like humans, but they all look like white people. But, you know, hey, sign of the times. Uh, now, it's all well and good with Korath. He's, he certainly gets uh, that really funny scene with, like, Star-Lord at the beginning. But, you, and he is fanatically devoted to Ronan's cause, but... Again, he's just not another terribly well fleshed out character, and it's just sort of like, dude, you caught Star Lord. Why are you still hanging around with this guy? I mean, are you so you're genuinely on Ronan's side? This this whole fanatical vendetta thing. I mean, seriously, they, they did need at least a little bit more to flesh this guy out, and we just don't get it, and that's very disappointing. Um, but uh, continuing on, uh, let's kind of wrap things up here with Ronan. Uh, played by Lee Pace, who, um, amazingly enough, I can remember his name. And Ronan is one of those characters that I've oddly been fond of for a very long time, but I can't really give you a good reason why. I suppose it's mostly just because Ronan the Accuser is a really cool name. And as you can see in uh, here in the movie, he's a very visually striking character. Uh, now here in the movie, his costume is more black, while in the comics he's more of a character who does kind of a dark, has a more of a dark green thing going on. And um, while it was cool and all, here Ronan is a very, frankly, one-dimensional villain. He's just like, okay, there's this peace treaty. My father and my grandfather and all a bunch of my ancestors died fighting a war against these people. I think this treaty is BS, so I'm going to go and I'm going to kill all these people just because otherwise it seems like, you know, my family's sacrifices are for nothing. And that could have been a really great motivation, but we don't really get into Ronan's head enough to make us really care about it. It's just like, Ronan does not like peace, and he wants to go and kill this entire planet full of people for a vaguely defined reason. And that's really about all we get out of him. Oh yeah, and Ronan is also stupid enough to go and threaten Thanos. <laughs> Now, it was funny to watch him kill Thanos' Chamberlain, but you're just like, dude, seriously? You're actually threatening Thanos? It's like, oh, man, how can you possibly be this stupid? Then again, you know, Ronan's drunk on the power of an Infinity Stone, so... 
and obviously was a little here to begin with. But, um, man, give it to Lee Pace. This guy just dives into it whole hog. I was reading uh, some stuff about it where he was sort of saying to James Gunn, the director, like, uh, do you want me to tone this down? And James just was like, no, no, keep going, keep hamming it up. And Lee Pace just goes balls out crazy with this. And <laughs> it really is a joy to watch. I, I mean, Ronan is, again, not a terribly deep villain, but... Oh man, does he just he he takes it up to eleven, so I I I have to give him respect for that. And um at the end of the day, I guess I'm just a little disappointed that they didn't do more with Ronan's character because in the comics in the recent years they've actually taken some real steps to give Ronan more depth as a character. Uh, there were some really nice moments that he had in the um, Infinity storyline that was Marvel's big um, space thing recently. And uh, speaking of Infinity, I kind of it took me a while to while I was watching this movie for it to dawn on me that the armor that Thanos is wearing I in this movie is actually the armor he wears during the Infinity story. And this is of course where we first get to hear Thanos and sort of get to get to sort of see a little bit about what's going on with him. And it, it's all well and good. I mean, this guy certainly comes across as very menacing, but again, he's he's still just a very vaguely divine, defined character. But again, they're saving they're saving the good stuff for with Thanos for uh, Avengers three, obviously. So we'll see. And uh, yeah, that kind of covers our um, antagonists for the most part. So let's kind of move over and talk about the heroes. And um, since I mentioned her before, let's kind of start start off with Gamora. And actually, out of all the characters in the Guardians, I was most disappointed by her, simply because my main thing is that Gamora is supposed to basically be Thanos' you know, favorite assassin, her, her and Nebula. And her whole thing is, oh, she finds out, oh, they're going to destroy a planet, I can't go along with that, and that's why she turns. And it's a little unclear if that if this is something that she had like getting away from Thanos is something she decided of beforehand, or if she changes her, she decides that's what she's going to do during that very brief scene at the beginning of the movie where we find out Ronan wants to destroy Xandar, and it's just like this 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 is her you know sort of breaking away from everything that's been a part of her life since she was a child, and apparently the most we get in terms of her. Make coming to this decision or struggling with this decision is a brief uncomfortable look at the start of the movie. Now, and this is actually seems to sort of fly in the face of again what happened in that Guardians prequel comic where you know she seemed to sort of enjoy you know being trained as uh, Thanos's assassin. And again, if we'd sort of seen Gamora actually doing something in service of Thanos before she starts making this decision, it really would have helped come come across that this was, you know, some actual development and growth of her as a character, but we don't. She just sort of like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be Thanos' assassin anymore, basically right from the get-go, and that's just really, really weak stuff in my book. And there's also all that stuff like when she gets ambushed at the prison. It's like, wait a minute, Gamora's a badass assassin. She should be able to tear these guys apart. Like, like guys like this should not be the slightest little threat to her. So you know, her needing the other guardians to kind of help her out, just no, no, that doesn't make sense at all. Uh, now I did like that um, she doesn't buy it when uh, Star Lord tries macking on her. Now we do get to see that there's obviously a bit of an attraction on her, but when you know uh, Starlord sort of breaks out the standard Casanova moves, it doesn't work and gets a knife shoved in his face, and that's cool. I was watching, and I was like, you know what, Gamora, good for you. And um, what was it she said to him? It's like your pelvic sorcery will not work on me, or something like that. That was definitely some hilarious stuff. Um. Now, one thing I noticed is if you remember the trailers, there was that one shot of Zoe Saldano, uh, you know, the bare side of her back, obviously kind of intended to bring in the sexy factor, and we don't see that in the movie. 
uh, after the whole uproar that people had about the, um, Ah, oh, hell, I can't remember the character's name. Not Nurse Chapel Lady running around in her underwear in Star Trek Into Darkness. I can understand why they would kind of tone that down. I mean, the most fan y thing we get with Gamora is um, Star-Lord shaking her butt out while she walks up some stairs. But again, that's just kind of more like Star-Lord has a thing for her. So, you know, yeah, you kind of have to have a little of the fan service in there, but... I'm kind of glad they kept that to a minimum. And, um, yeah, I kind of think that's all I had uh, had to say about Gamora. Um, one thing I noticed some people had commented on, that she's, the, like, the clothes she wears in this uh, version of the movie are actually not as skimpy as what she's known for sometimes wearing in the comics. Now, to be completely fair, in the comics, uh, in the modern comics, she basically kind of wears a sort of white bodysuit covers her up pretty well. So I am glad that they decided to put Gamora in, a, in practical clothes. Uh, so let's see. Let's go on and um, since we're talking about green skin folks, let's kind of talk about Drax. Um, not a huge amount to say about Drax. Uh, definitely well done. Nice job by Dave, by, by, by Batista there. But again, his his backstory is basically, oh, Thanos, like, Ronan murdered my family, and I'm going to kill Ronan. And the rest is just uh, stuff like, oh, he doesn't really understand metaphors. Well, he does understand the term give a shit when it's plot relevant. And I, I was actually in that scene, I was like, please, please don't let him be confused by this, because this would totally ruin the moment. So uh, I guess that was maybe... One of, like he had, must have had just some sort of epiphany or whatever in that moment and kind of figured out what Star-Lord was getting at. And we did see later on that he apparently does, at least has started to grab, grasp metaphors to some small degree. So we'll call that whole understanding what give a, that give a shit was not meant to be literal. Again, just sort of a beginner's luck early breakthrough. But anyway... Now, I did like that he went out and he, like, literally called Ronan, and then just so that he could fight him, and, of course, it causes everything to go to hell. You know, one of the great things in um, you can do with characters is have them make understandable but still very stupid decisions, and that's exactly what we get here. Drax just absolutely, positively wants to get his hands on Ronan, and this causes him to basically screw things up for everybody. But it's in realizing that, oh wow, I really screwed up, that he starts to break out and you know grow as a character. So that was definitely good stuff. Um, now Groot. Now Groot is one of those real oddballs where you know people had been basically campaigning online for years to try and get Vin Diesel to be Groot ever since they said we're going to do a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Probably due in no small part to his performance in the Iron Giant. And you know, and I do have to take a moment to point out that uh, Drax and uh, Riddick do seem to have more than a few things in common. But anyway, so. They um, were very mum about who was going to be doing anything with Groot for a very long time. And, of course, it did turn out to be Vin Diesel. So this is one of those times where those fan campaigns, which 90% of the time are completely ridiculous and stupid, actually did work. Then again, I imagine you probably didn't have to twist Marvel's arm too awful hard to get them to say, like, hey, maybe we should work with Vin Diesel. Because D Vin Diesel is you know, proven to be a very geeky fellow and a fan favorite. So, again, I don't think they had to work too awful hard. But anyway, even though uh, Groot only does have his classic uh, line, that uh, Vin Diesel does definitely did a great job of really selling all of that. And, because um, he did both voice and uh, motion capture for the character. <clears throat> And I definitely like how we get to see both, you know, the, the the softer side of Groot where he gives the little girl the flower, and then the scary side of Groot where he like kills half a dozen guys or something like that by impaling them and then beating them against a wall. <laughs> I love how even the other guards were like, jeez, which is, makes it kind of hilarious if you actually read the original story that he first appeared in. Uh, Groot was actually a villain. Uh, I was a little disappointed that they didn't kind of get into the, some of the details about Groot where you've 
things like, you know, him being a king or the fact that, you know, all he seems to say is, I am Groot, is really um, just his way of communicating is so far beyond most people that all we can hear is him saying that. Now, I do like that they do show that he's obviously just saying more than that, and Rocket Raccoon understands what he is saying. But again, I kind of wish that we'd gotten a little bit more details as to what was going on with him, but um, I, can, I can imagine they're probably keeping some of that in their back pockets just so they can throw out more WTF moments with Groot in the sequel. Uh, now, Rocket Raccoon. Now, when Pete... When, um, they actually brought Rocket Raccoon back in the comics. A lot of people were like freaking out. They're like, Rocket Raccoon, Rocket Raccoon, how can you do this? Rocket Raccoon is a ridiculous and stupid character. But um, the writers who brought him back into the Guardians of the Galaxy found a really, really awesome take on him, and we are seeing that here. Now, some people got upset that he didn't have a Cockney accent because I guess in one of the video games he appeared in or something like that, he did. But on stuff like Ultimate Spider-Man, he just spoke normal American English. So I, I think getting upset about that is kind of a silly thing. But um, Bradley Cooper's not somebody I'm really familiar with, but uh, he did an absolutely fantastic job. And I obviously, from what we've seen online, Groot and Rocket are sort of the real breakout characters from this movie. Uh, the thing with uh, Rocket shooting that machine gun from the first teaser kind of went nuts on Tumblr. People loved it. And, well, you know, uh, a talking raccoon shooting aliens with a space machine gun? Yeah. Not, not a surprise. But I really do like that... Actually, I would say that maybe you could kind of give a... Um, make the case for that Rocket is one of the better fleshed out characters in this movie. That scene where he, like, freaks out in the bar... And talks about you know being experimented on and about how everybody looks down on him as nothing but a pest and a piece of vermin. I mean, man, give Bradley Cooper some credit. He really, really sells all of that. And I honestly do think it's one of the best characterization scenes in the movie. And I'm glad Marvel really put that in there so that we understand a lot of where Rocket is coming from. And of course, he gets some of the funniest lines, and you know, it's just all around. I think one of the best fleshed out characters in the movie. Now, um, can't forget to talk about uh, Star Lord, since in a kind of ways, Star Lord is basically the main character in this movie. And again, um, Zachary, whatever his name is. Um, a lot of people freaked out when they cast him as Star Lord because he's basically known for playing some guy on Parks and Recreation, which is another one of those popular shows that I've never actually sat down and watched. They're like, no, come on, where in the world were you put him and make, make, make him Star Lord? Oh, shut the hell up. And again, this is just another one of those examples of where people don't seem to understand that actors have this thing called range. And if you give an actor a chance to play somebody very different than what it is that they've done before, sometimes those actors can do it and do it well. I mean, fandom just absolutely loves to typecast people, and the idea that somebody could play a character radically different than characters that they've played in the past continually seems to escape people. Now, that's not to say that sometimes they don't cast actors in roles for which they are not well suited. Yes, it does happen. But I guess it just annoys me that nobody is ever willing to give an actor the benefit of the doubt these days. But then again, we're talking about the internet where everybody is an expert and you know forecasting doom and gloom that never works out, but that a lot of the time doesn't work out, I guess I should say. Sometimes, yeah. But anyway, so he... He does have an interesting journey as a character, and you gotta admit, that scene with him opening, like, wandering around the alien ruins, obviously an homage to the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and, like, just using an alien rat lizard thing as a microphone, that's some hilarious stuff. Now, Star-Lord sort of going from thief to, you know, straight-up good guy does seem to be a little bit sudden. 
and I get, that is one of the things that really bugs me about this movie is the Guardians become friends awfully fast. But, again, time constraints, right? But uh, I definitely did like how you know, he's very protective of the, that stuff that he had from a kid because, you know, the clothes on his back and whatever he had in that backpack, that's all he had from Earth. Though apparently somewhere along the way, out in space, he got his hands on some old uh, cassette player thing that way too small to fit, in the, way too big to fit in the kid's backpack. And you notice that they um, identify Star Lord as a Terran, which kind of implies that he's not the first human to go out in space and sort of make a bit of a splash. Again, it could also just be that uh, the whole Chitari invasion of Earth caught a lot of caught the Nova Corps' notice. But again, you know that's uh, getting into stuff that's really beyond the scope of this movie. But uh, anyway, I guess um, a lot of what is going on with Star Lord is that he, it's sort of harken, he's hearkening back to what he to you know him be probably you get ugh, can't talk. You get the sense that he probably was raised in a very good and loving family. You know, was taught proper and values. And then Yandu kidnaps him and um, drags him off into space. And for for most, for the start of the movie, he's just kind of that person that Yandu raised him to be. But here we sort of see him coming back into being a um, more noble person. Now again, I think this transition was kind of quick, and as was his whole decision to sort of sacrifice himself to save Gamora, again, it all happens really kind of quick, but, well, in, in the comics, Star-Lord is portrayed as being generally a pretty good and noble guy, so I guess they just sort of wanted to start getting him on that path. But, you know, that scene like with him and Gamora out in space, that was really nicely done uh, very beautifully shot, and from what I understand, actually scientifically accurate. Despite what people think, if you're in the vacuum of space, you don't immediately. Pfft. In fact, I was even reading an uh, interview with um, the lady that co-wrote the movie with James Gunn, and she said talked about how she'd um, her father had basically been friends with a lot of guys who were literally rocket scientists when she was a kid, so she had a very key interest in uh, science and space, and kind of wanted to bring some more some elements of uh, realism to uh, this movie. But anyway, uh, kind of getting back to the Star-Lord as a little bit as a character. Uh, I got a kick out of just sorry, all that stuff that he had uh, posted around his ship. Like, um, And it was all great. There was all things you could find in a kid's backpack. Like, I, like, I love how there were like little uh, things of ALF on there. Because when I, when I about the time that he would have been taken from Earth, uh, Star-Lord uh, Marvel was actually pub publishing ALF comic books, and there were even um, big hints that it was the ALF comics were set somewhere in, set in the Marvel universe. I remember seeing, and I and I read these as a kid. Like the Watcher, I think showed up in one episode, one issue, and uh, so did, if I recall correctly, the High Evolutionary, and just like the High Evolutionary and ALF, I mean, just talk about a weird combination. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I said, Star-Lord's transition to being sort of a more stand-up kind of hero is kind of quick, but it's really well done. But I like how they kept that quirky sense of humor. So, uh, uh, just a scene where he challenges Ronan to a dance-off. Um, that is just an absolute... You can tell that's going to be like a classic, classic thing for many, many years. Because it's just like... <laughs> Just the absolute look on Ronan's face. He's really there and he's waving around the hammer. He's like, oh, I'm going to destroy you. I'm like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's just so utterly hilarious. And, of course, it all comes together where we get the big heroic moment where you know, Star-Lord tries to contain the power of the Infinity Gem and uh, all the Guardians have to come together. And, again, it's sort of very, very... Well, yeah, okay, let's be honest. It's, it's very cliche, but it is still very, very heartwarming in a lot of ways. And I like how they do go and explain it, because they're like, oh, well, it turns out you're only half human. Now, again, if you're familiar with the comics, uh, you understand, you know who uh, Star-Lord's father is. 
he's a big player in um, things like Infinity, and I think he was even around in the the, uh, the War of Kings storyline, but I, I might be wrong about that. And um, obviously, they're setting his dad up to be a big character in the sequel, which is all which is all well and good because his uh, father is an interesting character. Uh, now it dawns on me that I actually did forget to talk about Yondu, played of course by Michael Rooker from Walking Dead. And Yondu's all well and good, but one, he's significantly different than his uh, character in the comics, who was a member of the original Guardians when they first appeared back in, I believe it was 1968. And here, and I really hate to say it, but Yondu is basically Merle, Blue Merle Dixon in space. I mean, Michael Rooker is basically playing very much the same sort of character. He's a sort of sp basically space redneck mercenary guy. Uh, now, in the original comics, Yondu was a guy who fought with a bow, and a Mer uh, Yondu's weapon of choice basically seems to be this crazy arrow sort of thing, I, which I guess is intended as a nod to that. But it really just sort of feels like Yondu sort of went to Diagon Alley, strolled into Ollivander's wand shop, and walked out with, like, the most badass wand in the entire Harry Potter universe. <sighs> so, yeah, I was a little, um, little disappointed with Yondu. That they basically say, like, uh, Michael, Yondu is Space Merle. Got it. But, uh, anyway... That's about all I had to say about that. Now, just kind of looking at some of the um, bigger plot things. Um, uh, I, well, I've already actually kind of talked about my main plots, like Gamora, you know, not faring so well at the prison, and um, the, uh, the the Guardians come together there at the end. Um... Oh, there's so many things I want to talk about. Now it comes time to I completely blank on it. Oh yeah, uh, one thing I really did like seeing was um, nowhere, the big floating space thing, head thing in space. Now the them talking about uh, people coming in there to mine things like spinal fluid and brain matter, that kind of feels like they lifted a beat from uh, Pacific Rim. But again, it's only a little plot detail, so I'm okay with that. Uh, people who read the comics, they probably would have noticed that um, there was a dog running around in an old 50s Russian spacesuit. Uh, that's a character named Cosmo, who is a telepathic uh, Russian dog who appears in the Guardians comics, and is actually pretty amusing. <clears throat> uh, there were some nice uh, nods to uh, the, the cinematic universe uh, in the collector's thing that I didn't talk about when we mentioned him earlier. Uh, you, if you watch carefully, you can see a Chitari and a Dark Elf from Thor the Dark World. Uh, somebody online posted a screenshot actually from his cameo at, at the end of the last Thor movie where you can see this what looks like a big-ass cocoon in one of those display cases, and this is obviously a nod to folks from the comics who are familiar with the comics to Adam Warlock. And, um, of course, we also, we, we have to talk about the, sting, the uh, teaser at the end, where it's revealed that one of the things that uh, the collector had locked up in his collection was none other than Howard the Duck. And, uh, interestingly, Howard was voiced by Seth Green, so that was very cool. And um, I know that one thing you have to understand is um, this was a big surprise to a lot of people, simply because... They did make a live-action Howard the Duck, uh, oddly enough, back in, I think it was 1988. And it's pretty terrible. It's really sort of kind of the go-to for a lot of people for bad comic book movies. I mean, people loathe it. It's basically toxic in some, so many peop some people's minds. And um, I, I was glad that most people online seemed to be very amused by uh, Howard popping up there. I was actually expecting completely the opposite re reaction. I expect people like, oh, God, Howard the Duck, now this movie is completely ruined for you. It's like, man, I hate people like that. I really do. It's like, seriously, he's there for five seconds. But um, 
yeah, I, I've been talking for almost 40 minutes, so I think this is a good place to wrap this up. So, all in all, so despite some flaws, this is, uh, at the end of the day, a pretty darn good movie. I had a lot of fun with it, a lot of good performances. Uh, a lot of people have been saying this is really one of the Marvel Cinematic Universe's best movies, and I cannot disagree with them on that. So, I'm already looking forward to Guardians 2, and um, hopefully when that time comes, I will be able to do another review for you. Until next time, guys, take care and have a good one. And, of course, you, if you're, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi.